Praise the Lord. Wonderful to be with you this morning and praying you all had a wonderful time this last week to gather together with family, with friends, to celebrate a meal and remember all the good things in our lives. I'm sure after that, that large meal, you're just recently waking up from that turkey coma that inevitably comes after the meal. And through this season, here at Cornerstone, we've been uh, unpacking and seeking to understand in greater measure all the benefits that we have that we give thanks for because of our union with Christ. You know, as we rightly gather and celebrate all the good things in our life, let us not forget from where and from whom all good things come. Anything that you give thanks for in your life should find its ultimate thankfulness in the person of God Himself. And so we've been exploring that in some measure, and we open that time up by seeing that Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills all the promises of God, and so therefore Jesus is our hope. That is Jesus who secures our redemption such that I no longer need to live in anxiety if I will be accepted by God because He will be accepted and I am in Him. We saw that because of Jesus, our work and our vocation has eternal significance. We saw that in Jesus Christ, we experience reconciliation, yes, with God, but as we saw last week, also with one another. And so today is a bit of a hinge as we are turning from Thanksgiving, and as we are doing in our own lives, we're turning from Thanksgiving and looking forward into the Christmas season. And so today, as we continue to remember the benefits of Christ, we want to explore what is perhaps, and maybe what is definitively, what is definitively, God's greatest gift, God's greatest benefit. If you were to, in your mind, conceive of what is God's greatest gift? What do you think that would be? <laughs> I'm sure you're all whispering the same thing. Maybe, maybe. And so what we're going to be exploring and unpacking, because even if we intuitively know, it is good to remind ourselves some of the depth of the reality of what is God's greatest gift to His people. And so as we explore that together, we'll be looking at the book of Philippians. Philippians is a letter that the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, is writing from prison. It's a letter that is overflowing with thankfulness and joy because the Philippian church was one that was a faithful partner in ministry with the Apostle Paul. In fact, he's writing it to say thank you for a gift that was given from the church to the Apostle. And in that letter, he's unpacking what it means to follow after Christ and how to value Him for who He is above all else. And so we're going to be unpacking from the book of Philippians what is God's greatest gift from Philippians chapter 3. I invite you to stand as we read this together. We're going to begin in verse 4 through verse 11. The Apostle Paul and the Word of God. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing the greatest gift that God has ever given, Jesus Christ, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own by which I seek to save myself, which would come from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Christ and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. 
Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the Word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated, and let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank You of the great gift of Christ. And Lord, we thank You for the gift of Your Word as You have inspired them for us, Your people. We pray this morning, Holy Spirit, as you fall in our present in this place and in our hearts, that the power of the Holy Spirit, that which raised Jesus Christ from the dead, would open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that we would see, that we would hear, that we would understand, turn, be healed, and transform. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we said, we're talking this morning about God's greatest gift which is the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. As it says in the Gospel of John chapter 3, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whomsoever should believe on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That Jesus Christ is God the Father's greatest gift, and that in so giving Jesus, because of the nature of who He is, being both fully man but also fully God, God's greatest gift is really the gift of Himself. And the reason why God's greatest gift is the gift of His Son and the gift of Himself is that God Himself is the being of most infinite worth. God is infinitely valuable and majestic, and so, the course, of course, the giving of Himself would be the greatest gift. To remind ourselves of the greatness and the majesty of God, the theologian Jonathan Edwards, someone who participated in the Second Great Awakening here in the United States, talks about the greatness of God, and he puts it this way. He says, this earth appears to us as a very great thing. When we think of the large countries and the continents and the oceans and the great expanse, the distances between one country and another, when we think of the whole of the earth together, the earth appears very great and very vast. But especially doth the great universe surprise us with its greatness, to which without doubt this vast earth as we call it, is less than even a speck of dust, if ever we saw it, that is, to the whole earth. And what Jonathan Edwards is saying is, if you think about the earth, the vastness of the earth, the vastness of it, and compare that to the all of the universe, that the earth is like a speck of dust compared with all that God has made. And if Jonathan Edwards knew what we knew about the universe, the greatness of the expanse of what God has made, isn't it that much more so that the earth is like a speck of dust compared to the greatness of all of creation in the universe? But Jonathan Edward goes on. He says, but how shall we be surprised when we think that all this vast creation, all the universe, making the most of it we can, it is infinitely less when compared with the greatness of God. It is infinitely less than the least discernible atom is to the whole of creation. So Jonathan Edwards would say, if we think about the value, the greatness of the earth, it's like a speck of dust compared to all of creation. But if we think about God and His greatness and His majesty, then the whole universe is as the smallest atom in its worth in comparison to the infinite greatness of Almighty God, who is over all. And if God is the greatest, most majestic, beautiful, glorious being in all of creation, then as we open the opening pages of Scripture and see what humanity lost when, because of their sin, they were exiled out of the Garden of Eden. The greatest loss that humanity has in their exile from the Eden ideal of what God created is not Eden. 
The greatest loss is God. And the reason why is because God is that which is of greatest value. I mean, think if your house was today, if you were to go home and your house would burn down, that which have been the greatest loss was that would have been the greatest value. Not necessarily monetary. That which is of greatest value is the greatest loss. And when Adam and Eve were removed from Eden, our greatest loss was relationship with God because He is of infinite worth. But we were made by our Creator to exist in relationship with Him. We were made for covenant relationship and partnership with God. And the loss of that which is infinitely great has created a crack down the center of the human soul. That which now all of humanity exists in is as a fundamental lack. There is something broken. There is a fissure down our hearts that comes as a result of our separation from God Himself. And ever since the loss of God, humanity has been on a mission to solve that problem, to solve the problem of the crack in their soul, to seek to heal the brokenness that comes from a result of separation from the Creator, to be on what we might conceive of as self-salvation projects to save themselves. In fact, when you look at the world today, and sometimes we don't need to look further than our own hearts, we see people in all sorts of broken ways seeking to save themselves. How much of sin in this world are people doing what is right in their own eyes? People that are doing what they conceive to be good in an effort to solve their own life's problems in all sorts of broken ways that we call sin. One of our missional statements is to connect with the world. And one way we connect with the world is through the gospel. And when we, we've been talking about the gospel here and how to connect with the world through the gospel by the means of three circles. And the three circles talks about this brokenness. The three circles talks about our separation from the infinitely worthy and majestic God because God created all of creation and humanity perfectly good with a design for all of life, which is in line with His character, which is good. But man by sin has departed from that and therefore exists in brokenness. This is a great way to communicate the gospel. So simple. All you need is a napkin. And what those little squiggly lines represent are broken attempts for people to save themselves. But it's a fool's errand because there's only one way to heal the crack in our souls, and that is to be restored in relationship with God. And our restoration with God comes not because we save ourselves or establish our own righteousness and things will unpack, but because we cling to Christ, because we repent and believe in His perfect righteousness, and His perfect righteousness becomes our own. We're remade, we're reborn, we're resurrected. And so we can, in our new life with Christ, recover and pursue God's design again in relationship reconciled with the infinitely good Creator God. And by the way, this is a great tool. And I, I don't know if you know this, but I, I kept my phone here in my pocket. It's kind of dangerous. We have these little stickers that have the little three circles on them. I know you probably can't see it for you out there, but we got, we got these for free out there. But all I do, I, I have my little phone out here. When I sit down with someone, I put it on the table, and I put it down like this. And I want people to go, what is that? Oh, yeah, funny. You know what that is? This is God's design for us. We've departed from it, and we're all kind of broken too, and I can be broken too, but through Christ, we can be redeemed to pursue God's design again. Would you want to talk more about that? It's a great little tool. It's free. Take one with you. Put, on your, put it wherever you want. Put on your bumper sticker. Whatever. All right. 
So we have this brokenness, which, and brokenness and these broken are self-salvation projects to save ourselves. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is telling the Philippian church he was doing. Now, he describes it with the language of confidence in the flesh. I'm pursuing my self-salvation project to, as he says, establish my own righteousness, to save myself. He says, I'm not, I don't do that anymore. I, that was who I was. But by the way, if someone was going to go about the project of saying, saving themselves, I was doing a great job. And look how great I am. Look at all these things. You know, if you were to see, if, if the Apostle Paul were here, and, and you were to see all these lists, and you were to diagnose the strategy by which the Apostle Paul, or let's just say Saul the Pharisee before he knew Christ, this Saul the Pharisee was attempting to save himself, and you were to diagnose it, what would you say it is? He's saving himself by means of what? Works, morality, being a good person, maybe his standing in the community, being well thought of, by others, being honored by others. Do you ever talk to anyone today about Christ? They say, I don't need to know about Jesus. I'm a good person. You see, they're on their self-salvation project by means of their morality. By the way, will any of us be able to stand before Almighty God on the basis of our own morality? No, because the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. But we don't have to be like the Apostle Paul to try to be on our self-salvation project through our own morality, although some of us might be or we know some people that might be. We can pursue it in all sorts of other ways, or the other people outside of Christ can pursue their own righteousness or their own salvation in all sorts of ways. I can seek to establish my own righteousness to be right, to be saved, to heal this fissure, to to heal this crack down my soul, because everything's going to be good in my life once I this. I'll be saved once I have a certain income level. My life isn't good right now, but it will be once that happens. Things aren't good in my life right now. I, I need salvation. I recognize there's something wrong with me, but it will be. It will be once I get that new position at work. Things aren't great now, but it will be. I'll find salvation once I get that new house, once I get that new kitchen, once I get that new car, once I have that relationship that I want, once I get out of that relationship I can't stand. Salvation is always on the other side of the hill. It's like the person seeking after the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The promise is there. But as you go to seek for it, do you ever find it? There are as many ways to save ourselves as there are people. In this last season, I was reading a novel by a a Russian. His name's Dostoevsky. He wrote a novel called The Brothers Karamazov. And The Brothers Karamazov is the story of a family, three brothers. One of those brothers is named Dmitri. And Dmitri is on a self-salvation project. He believes he can experience redemption and a whole newness of life if only he could have the object of his desire, who is a woman. Her name is Granushka. And she is described by Dostoevsky as very beautiful, very beautiful. But it's interesting to describe the language, to see the language that Dostoevsky used to to describe Dmitri's belief Because like you and I are beloved, because like so much of the world, the belief is if I can only have that, my life will be made new. And here's how he puts it, that Dimitri dreamed constantly and feverishly about this renewed, virtuous life. He believes that if he can have Granuchka, if he can have this relationship, he will be virtuous. He'll be a whole new man. He says that he yearned for this resurrection, this newness of life from death, and a renewal. And he, like so many others, in similar straits, believed most of all in a change of location. If it were not for these people, 
If it were not for these circumstances, I could be reborn. Brothers and sisters, the only source that can bring us newness of life is Jesus Christ. Every other place that we turn, every other source of life will let you down. They're like broken cisterns, the Bible says. It's like trying to put water in a colander. How well does that go? One philosopher, just to keep unpacking just for a second, he puts it very well. Because we, when we want something, we believe something about the thing that we want. We believe that if we can have it, everything is going to be great. We do believe that if you're honest. If only I could this, if only I could that, once I have it, my life will be changed. Slovenian philosopher named Slavoj Zizek, he, he describes it very well. He says, look, when we encounter in reality the object which has all the properties of the fantasized object of desire, we are of necessity disappointed because the thing that exists in your imagination is not the real thing that you get. How often does this happen? Oh, if only I get the new position at work, I'm going to be a whole new man. Everything will be fixed, and then you get the position, and it's worse than it was before. If only I move to the new house. Once we get to the new house, my life is going to be different. I'm going to be changed. Everything's going to work out once I get to the new house. You get to the new house, and it has more problems than your old house. Once I move, once I get down to Tennessee, once I retire, once I get divorced, once I get married, once I have kids, once my kids act a certain way, once something happens, then everything's going to be different. When you get it, you realize, as he says, we experience a certain this isn't it. We, it becomes evident, he says, that the finally found real object, the thing that you actually get, is not the reference of desire. You see, the human heart longs for something. As the St. Augustine says, the church father, our hearts are restless until what? Until they rest in Thee, Lord God. The interesting thing is, Slavoj Zizek, not a Christian. So, you know what Slavoj Zizek would say? Look, you just need to accept this. You need to accept the fact that you can never really be satisfied. You need to resign yourself and just get over it. You will never be satisfied. What do we say to that as believers? I count that as rubbish because there is an object of desire that when we gain it, or when, better said, when it gains us, when it grabs a hold of us and draws us to Himself, we are satisfied. That's why the Apostle Paul says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Everything that I was, everything that I was seeking after, everything that I thought if I had that, it's as nothing. Because when we have Christ, we no longer exist within a fundamental constitutive lack, but we exist within a fundamental constitutive fullness. And what that means is, is that to the core of ourselves, within our souls, that crack down the center of our hearts is healed and filled in by the Holy Spirit, which is the love of God which is poured into our hearts. It renews, remakes us, resurrects us, and we are reborn. As we are united to Christ in His death, we are reunited with Him in His resurrection, and we experience a newness of life. The Apostle Paul says, look, I could give away everything, I could be done with everything, as long as I know, as long as I know Christ. And the Apostle Paul is not saying, well, I could list, you know, that, that you know, Jesus is that, you know, some kind of a listing of information, there's nothing wrong with that. What he's saying is, is that I know Him, that just like a person knows another person, like a, a relationship, I know him, I'm in a relationship, it's, it's a dynamic thing. And that when I know him, when I'm in relationship with him, I, you can take everything else. Jesus plus nothing gives me everything, and you can take everything else. 
Because if I don't have Christ, I have nothing. Jesus Himself says, this is eternal life, that they may know You, Heavenly Father, and that they may know Me, Your Son, whom You have sent. So can we say together and agree together that Jesus Christ is the greatest good? We agree with that? Anyone disagree? Oh, disagree. Whoa, don't disagree. Don't do that. He is the greatest good. Can we also agree that when we seek to find the fulfillment somewhere else besides Christ, we are of necessity disappointed? We agree on that. So if we agree on these two things, Jesus Christ and God Himself is the greatest good and the greatest gift, and that when we seek to find life anywhere else besides Him, we will of necessity be in despair. How does that change how we live? Should it change how we live? Does it change how you live? Does it? I mean, mean, let's just hypothetical here. Let's just say I was to say my greatest good in life is um, Mexican food. The greatest good in my life is Mexican food. Any amens, Mexican food? Amen. So, let's say I was to say, we all agree together, for some reason we all agree Mexican food is the greatest good because it's infinitely great, and if you try to find satisfaction outside of Mexican food, you will of necessity be disappointed. We all agree on that. But every time you see me, I'm eating at Chow Michis. Now, I can say all I want about Mexican food being my greatest good, but if I'm hanging out at Chow Michis, you have every right to sit down next to me and go, brother, this ain't a burrito. <laughs> okay? This is pasta with sausages. This is not, this is not a taco. Okay? There's no enchiladas on this menu. So, you can say all you want about Mexican food being the greatest good, but the way you live, it it ain't, obviously it ain't, okay? Because if Mexican food is your greatest good, you'd be down somewhere there serving Mexican food. You'd eat at Mexican restaurants. You'd be going to Mexican groceries. You'd be talking, you'd be making Mexican, you'd be doing, you'd be a lot heavier too, okay? So, if Jesus is the greatest good, and if we live in a way that is to demonstrate that fact, What difference does it make? One way to help us think about this is one of the great catechisms of the Reformed faith. Catechism, just, you know, teaching, a question and answer, comes to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question one, which asks this question, look, what is your life all about? Isn't that pretty important to ask? What's your life really about? Well, what's the purpose of your life? That's a great place to start. Now, it answers that question. The purpose of your life is to do two things. Isn't that great? Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, it says what's man's chief end, but we're just translating here a little bit. What's the purpose? What's it all about? Let's spend just a moment unpacking this. What does it mean to say that if we're going to live that Jesus is the greatest good and that I will not seek good outside of Him, then I will live in a way that glorifies Him. Now, what does it mean to glorify God? How do you do that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to what? The glory of God. So there's something about glorifying God that's all-encompassing of all of life, and that when we glorify God, our lives are bent in His direction in a way that honors Him. When we glorify God, we honor God in all that we say and do. We see this principle laid out in the prophet Malachi. Malachi is a, 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 one of the last prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's really a series of six disputations between God and His people. The first one, God says, I have loved you. And the people say, how have you loved us? So, let's look at the second one. You can want to see how does God answer that. Look at Malachi in the first five verses. In the second disputation, it says this, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? Where is my reverence? Where is my awe? Where is my glory? 
says the Lord of hosts, to you who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? He says, by offering polluted food on my altar. He goes on to say, look, if you were to take the offerings that you are offering and offering them to your governor, he wouldn't accept them. And you're going to offer it to me? The being of infinite worth? If God is our greatest good, then should we not live in a way that demonstrates that He gets the best of who we are? Is that fair? If God gets the leftovers of who we are, can we really say that we are glorifying Him with all that we eat, drink, and whatever we do? He should get the best of us, and our whole life should be bent towards Him in obedience. We honor God by obeying Him. Easier said than done sometimes. But Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 15 says, if you love me, then what? Obey my commandments. So we glorify God by obeying Him, by honoring Him, and giving Him the best of ourselves. But that's not all this says, because it also says that we do so by enjoying Him. Now, what does that mean? Because is there a way to obey God from a bare religion that is disconnected from a heart of devotion? Everyone said, yes. And so we dare not think, well, as long as I'm just kind of from an empty place in my heart doing right things, that God's going to be glorified. No, these things are connected. We glorify Him, and we are wholeheartedly devoted to Him. Just to hear some of what that sounds like, just let this wash over you. Uh, Some of these passages from the Psalms, the Psalms overflows with devotion. In Psalm 73, he says, look, whom am I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth, nothing that I desire in comparison to you, God. Psalm 16 says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good. You are not in my life. I have nothing good apart from you. You are my chosen portion and my cup. We see in Psalm 42, look, if you think about an animal that is just desperate, desperate from what keeps it alive, that's how much I desire you, God. I thirst, I pant, my soul pants to be with you, God. Even think about the end of Psalm 23. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall what? Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why does David want to spend time in the temple? Why would he want to spend eternity in the temple? Who's in the temple? Who's there? The presence of the Lord. His desire was to be with God. And so, as we live a life of obedience and honoring God, we have a heart that is overflowing with love and thankfulness and fullness towards God. And as we close, there's one preacher in the last generation that has done us a great service in understanding how this works. Reformed Baptist, I think in Minnesota, his name was John Piper. John Piper, if you don't know John Piper, go listen to John Piper. John Piper helps us by saying that, okay, if we look at this answer, we say man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him, forget, uh, enjoy him forever. What does John Piper do? He changes the and to by. Man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying Him together. He brings these two concepts together. And and I think this is the secret ingredient to make this really click. You've ever had somebody's chili, and it's basically all chilies are made the same, but there's like a secret ingredient here or there. You know, I put maple syrup in it or something like that. Well, this is the secret ingredient here. This is what is really going to make this click. You glorify God by enjoying Him. John Piper gives two illustrations. He gives lots, but we'll use two. These are John Piper's illustrations not mine, because they're good. 
He says, it's like being at a table. We just sat down a couple days ago at tables together, didn't we? He's like, it's like being invited to a meal. And this meal has been prepared by the person that has invited you, a hostess or a host. Someone has gone to great lengths to prepare the food, to prepare the setting, and it's beautiful. And the food looks amazing. Now, you come into that setting. You could very well honor the person that made it. And you could enjoy the meal. Yes. But doesn't it make sense to honor the person that made it by enjoying the meal? When you sit down at the table, beautifully spread, and you partake of the delicious food that has been prepared for you, and then as you eat it, you overflow and effuse thankfulness and great. This is amazing. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And you're, and you're just enjoying this. This satisfies me. I'm so grateful. Does that not honor and glorify the person who made it? One more example. This example is a husband who is coming home on the day of his anniversary. Okay, so he comes home, he has flowers, he puts the flowers behind his back, and he comes to the front door and he knocks on the front door. Now, that's a little unusual, right, for a man to knock on his own door. But he knocks on the door, his wife opens the door, he says, honey, happy anniversary. And then she goes, oh, that's so great. Why did you do this? And if he is to say, because it's my duty, I'm supposed to. Here's your flowers. We're going to dinner. <laughs> okay, wives, how honored do you feel? Uh, you very rightly would be like, thanks for not. What, this is your, your duty. How often do we treat God that way? That's why the Lord says, I desire steadfast love. Rather than all these burnt offerings, I want your heart. I want your devotion because you have mine. And so, the right thing to do, husbands, is we come to the front door, we knock, we say, happy anniversary. He goes, oh, why have you done this? And you say, honey, because I love you, it's our anniversary, and I want nothing more than to spend the evening with you. Wouldn't you rather hear that, wives? <laughs> what does that do? It honors you. And your husband is honoring you because he's making much of you through the enjoyment of your relationship. It's through the enjoyment that you are honored. And so it is with our relationship with God. It's as, yes, we live in obedience, but we do so from a heart of devotion and love that clings to Christ because He is our greatest good. He is eternal life. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You that You sent the greatest gift, the gift of Jesus, the gift of Yourself, infinitely valuable, infinitely majestic and beautiful. And Lord, thank You that by Your Holy Spirit You turn us to Yourself. You reveal Your beauty in the face of Christ. Lord, I pray that we would turn away from any other source of life but Christ, that we would rest and find our satisfaction in Him, that we would glorify Him in all that we say and do, and that we would do so by our enjoyments as we know Him as our Lord, our Savior, our friend, and our brother. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.